Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar organized by FIP under our FIP digital events. Our program for today is on pharmacists advancing pharmaceutical care. And our presentation is on uh, the various conditions which are the communicable diseases, the role of pharmacists in infectious and tropical diseases and management. This is where we are looking for the role of the pharmacists. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Next slide. I'll introduce myself. My name is Jocelyn Chaiva. I'm a pharmacist from Zimbabwe, currently the vice president of the African Pharmaceutical Forum. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, as per our advertisement for the conference, uh, we've got a, uh, I have to make some announcements before we get started so that we have uh, the housekeeping rules. First of all, the webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. Listen in in French by clicking the French channel icon. The recording will be available on our website, which is www.events.fip.org. You may ask questions uh, using the question box provided. You are welcome to provide feedback to webinars at fip.org. And finally, I would like to invite all those who are not members to become members of FIP and you can join using the website, which is www.fip.org slash membership registration. Welcome. Thank you. Next slide. Right, our event, the program for today, it said the role of pharmacists in infectious and tropical disease prevention. And then our speakers, we've got Dr. Murphin, Dr. Arinola, Prof. Natalie. So what we are the, according to our program, we've got the role of pharmacists from the various uh, perspectives. So the country case from Nigeria will be presented by Dr. Arinola Joda from Nigeria and uh, from South Africa. We have got Natalie Shelek, and then we have question and answer session where we can interact. We want to hear from you what you would think about the presentations. And then we can pull, we have the polls, which are part of uh, the preparation and uh, evaluation of our webinars. And then we'll wrap up and close. Next slide, please. So from your perspective, and in the African context, our challenges uh, pharmacists encounter in carrying out their roles in their infectious and tropical disease prevention and management programs. And what are the solutions which can be provided to these challenges? Because whenever you have challenges, we need to look at possible solutions. So it's not just challenges, but we also need to look at possible solutions. Next slide, please. Before we start, on behalf of FIP, we'd like to thank Sanofi for supporting this digital event. This has made it possible for us to share all these impo this important information with all our members and non-members whom we hope will be joining FIP in the near future. Thank you to Sanofi. We look forward to continued engagement. All right. Also, our webinar is not like from the off the cuff. This is based on poor results from previous events in this series. So we want to bring you this event on the role of pharmacists in infectious and tropical disease prevention. What you are viewing right now is the poor results from uh, what was circulated previously. So we had uh, pharmacists, they're interested in uh, various topics. And the one on question six, of our previous questionnaire or the poll was on infectious diseases and neglected tropical diseases. That one had the biggest poll and as such as FIP, we've arranged for this webinar, which we are going to share with you today. We hope we will, uh, everyone will enjoy. And as we go through, and if you have got any other comments, please, as I said earlier on, you can write in our chat box comments uh, on, to, on how we can improve that 
and any other topics in this area which you might want to share with us or which you want FIP to share with you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Right, so the based on uh, the polls, we have come up with a program whereby the learning objectives of this uh, webinar today is uh, to improve the knowledge of pharmacists in the scope of infectious and tropical diseases, as well as within the African region. Secondly, we also want to showcase practices across different countries with regards to policy, pharmaceutical care, and digital health applications in the context of infectious and tropical diseases, as well as antimicrobial agents in the Africa region. We would also want to identify the needs and priorities of pharmacists in prevention and management of infectious and tropical diseases within the African region. Those are our learning objectives. Next slide, please. So our first presenter today is a Dr. Mephin Mpundu. He is a director of REACT Africa and is a member of the FIP Antimicrobial Resistance Commission. He has got broad experience from the Afro region and abroad. Without taking much of uh, your time, I'll hand over this time to Dr. Mephin Mpundu to give his presentation. Dr. Mpundu, you can come in. You're welcome to this event. Thank you. Next slide. Jocelyn, it seems Dr. Mephin has a connectivity issue. Oops. Can you hear us, Dr. Mephin? Dr. Mephin, are you with us? Uh, let me just check on the on the group. If he's he's still connected, us. but seems like he's having issues with connection. Mm. Yeah. Oh, we can see him right now. Uh, can you hear me or not? We hear you, but if you can just turn off your camera, we can hear you better, probably. Yes. Yeah, they... The internet is quite bad. I mean, I deserve it, right? it's quite bad. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, we'll be looking at the role of pharmacists in infectious and tropical diseases, prevention and management. Infectious uh, tropical diseases are defined as communicable diseases that flourish in hot, humid conditions, unique to tropical and subtropical regions. And so in this group, we're looking at um, um, things like chronic parasites or related bacteria and viral infections. They've got an adverse effect on child development, on pregnancy, and on a lot of outcomes uh, that include economic outcomes in terms of productivity. The most common infections uh, of the world's poorest, uh, those that live under a dollar and 25 uh, cents a day are in Africa, Asia, Central, and Southern Americas. Most of them, especially those that are categorized under neglected tropical diseases, NTB, uh, TDs, they lack treatment and curative options or vaccines. Some of the examples that I, we do highlight here are actually chikungunya, for example, dengue, um, leprosy, and others. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. The burden of healthcare inequality gives us um, a bit of a picture of what happens. That I mean, when patients are admitted in hospital, 10% uh, of those that are hospitalized in low and middle income countries uh, 
uh, can acquire a hospital acquired infection as opposed to actually 7% in high income countries. When one looks at the um, uh, levels of um, uh, or diagnosis in terms of accuracy, again, uh, one third of the time in this study that was done show that uh, um, that clinical guidelines for the common conditions um, were not followed nearly 45% of the time. Then when we look at the management of antenatal care or family planning and pediatric care, again, they were very, very low. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. So in the African context, I mean, Africa has a high burden of infectious diseases. This is compounded by the population that is actually projected to grow to about 2.5 billion by 2050. We face a triple burden of HIV, AIDS, cholera, malaria, uh, meningitis, and other, and other diseases. But we also have uh, uh, some of the worst poor living conditions in terms of, I mean, a lack of infrastructure and Sorry, we can't hear you, Dr. Mephin. It seems this network is uh, giving problems. Um, we can't hear you, Dr. Mephin. I think your network. Jocelyn, he seems to be disconnected. Yeah, now he's dropped off. Let's wait for a few minutes if you'd like. If he doesn't come back, maybe we'll move on to our next presentation. All right. In the meantime, we can read the slide and uh, try to internalize it. Our apologies, colleagues. He's trying to reconnect. Jocelyn, we can launch the polls maybe in the meantime while we are waiting for him. All right. Well, he's back actually. Is it? Yeah, um, he just joined. Let's check. The internet okay. connection is, is terrible. I'm at the hotel in Addis, I'm sorry. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah. yeah, you were talking on this slide, uh, Dr. Mervyn. Yeah. yeah, really, 660 million people do not have any access to clean drinking water, and one in, uh, in eight people currently defecate in the open, and a third of the world's population do not have a safe toilet, uh, and most of this are going to happen um, in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, with poor nutrition and compounded with lack of clean drinking water, you know, there is a higher chance of getting infections. And these infections actually can lead into, I mean, increase them in stigma, but also for people to get more poor and be marginalized. Uh, next slide. Uh, so AMR is a problem in all regions of the world, but the prevalence of resistance actually varies. Um, in the recent study that was released at the start of this year, the Gram study, they were able to show that um, um, in 2019, 255,000 deaths were uh, directly caused by bacterial AMR in 2019. And this also is actually disproportionate with children where actually one in five deaths uh, were attributed also to AMR in children under the age of five in 2019. Next slide. And some other further actually findings um, of the Gram study uh, showed again in excess of 1.27 million global excess deaths were actually attributed to drug resistance. 
Um, AMR has become a leading cause of death I mean, globally higher than HIV and AIDS, and uh, uh, the culprits are, are the priority pathogens. It's E. coli, I'm Staph aureus, I'm K. pneumonie, um, A. baumani, and P. originosa. All age death rate attributed to actually AMR is highest in Western Sub-Saharan Africa at about I mean, to, uh, 27.3 deaths per 100,000 and lowest um, in Australia and Asia at about 6.5. Next slide. This is setting up a context in terms of the role that we have. The impact of health inequality on AMR is such that antibiotic resistance risks go up with inequalities within society. Groups that are more vulnerable, again, are women, children, migrants, and refugees, and AMR or antibiotic resistance can increase the stigmatization of people with infectious diseases, and that drives inequality. And these are things that we have to be able to understand as pharmacists well. Next slide. So re antibiotic resistance is in a vicious cycle with poverty. Uh, people living in poverty are more prone to infectious diseases and the cost of having an infectious uh, um, disease actually uh, goes up with poverty. And so we do have this vicious cycle that uh, really poverty drives infectious diseases and infectious diseases drives people into poverty. Next slide. The traditional roles of a pharmacist um, in Africa has largely been focusing really on uh, dispensing, on supply chain functions, on produce. Uh, on providing some actually advice in terms of medications and in terms of you know um, uh, you know uh, uh, diagnosis, but sometimes pharmacists uh, in some countries. Uh, do prescribe illegally where they are not allowed by law. They prescribe over the counter. Education and counseling have been some of the traditional roles, including uh, vaccinations in very few countries, which is actually just coming up. And I'll talk about that in the next slides. Next slides. So pharmacists, uh, we play a critical role in patient counseling and in provision of safe and effective antimicrobials and vaccines. Uh, for both prevention and therapeutic use to manage and completely eradicate infectious tropical diseases. And also we play a major role in research and development. Next slide. These are some of the roles that you and I can play in terms of infectious and tropical disease management and prevention. One is promoting population health. And this is where we also looking at the uh, you know, at the, uh, the health indicators, but also the determinants of health. Uh, we, uh, we can play a role in developing uh, disease prevention and control programs in the facilities that we work. We can be able to promote medication safety efforts in institutions and communities and engage in antimicrobial stewardship efforts, uh, including prevention, intervention and treatment. But we can also be involved in developing health education policies and programs at, at an institutional levels and engaging with professionals, community leaders, and the public at large. Next slide. Advocating for sound legislation, regulations, and public policy uh, regarding disease prevention and management is critical. Most of the pharmaceutical societies and pharmacists do not engage with policymakers in terms of really developing uh, uh, policies and legislation that would promote public health. We should be engaging in public health related research and education programs, but also initiating campaigns that will be able to disseminate and share the knowledge and provide them I mean, training programs uh, on basic population health tools and ensuring that we use epidemiology and disease uh, surveillance uh, uh, data and also techniques and also risk reduction strategies, um, insights into our methodology. Next slide. These are some of the expanded roles of pharmacists uh, really in public health in terms of addressing uh, 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 neglected diseases and tropical diseases. Next slide, and I'll go. I'll go pretty fast. Uh, uh, we have 
in, in the US, for example, uh, a really pharmacist role has emerged and they get involved in medication therapy uh, management functions. And these functions, uh, they include uh, medication reviews and they look at the therapy. Is it in line with our guidelines? Is it in line with the kidney functions, uh, with the PK and the PD? Uh, they look at uh, disease management and coaching, really. Uh, they look at really anticoagulant uh, uh, management, and also they are involved in health, wellness, public health, and medication safety surveillance. But they also play a major role in prevention of diseases, and that by focusing in immunizations, uh, where pharmacists I mean, provide over 10 vaccinations, and also they are involved in screening of cholesterol, diabetes, and other um, conditions. Next slide. The other role that pharmacists can play is in the uh, role of research and development, uh, uh, being involved in, um, in R&D and focusing on priority pathogens where we do not have uh, uh, new antibiotics. And this is getting involved in biotechnology. Uh, you know, I'm getting involved in really coming up uh, with new molecules uh, through uh, uh, research, um, in the African region and working with uh, the newly established CDC and the African Union are uh, promoting. And for example, you know, uh, uh, we can also promote a new entrance of new antibiotics. And I give an example of uh, 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 in that, you know, it's in clinical trials for actually uh, uh, gonorrhea, but it is also indicated in UTIs. Next slide. The other role that I, uh, next slide. Next slide, I can't. It's in the, yeah, yeah, in supply chain. Again, in supply chain, the functions of the pharmacist, again, you know, are, are from actually uh, research and development uh, from the bench, I mean, through the clinical trials, manufacturing, distribution, and utilization, and ensuring that the supply chains, we are not chronically out of stock. And also equally ensuring that, that I mean, antibiotics that are used uh, in the treatment of infections uh, we protect their functions. And so stewardship interventions are quite critical in this case. Next slide. In delivery of virtual pharmaceutical care, we are moving into the digital world. And this is where applications can be used um, from really teleconsultation. For example, if a hospital pharmacy only runs until 5 p.m., or 6 p.m., they can actually outsource the service. I mean, uh, from a telepharmacy that can clear and look at their orders and be able to provide, uh, you know, uh, 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 medications that are needed. And this equally um, ensures that we strengthen our technology systems in terms of information systems. And in some countries now, you can even use, I mean, uh, uh, really technology like drones to deliver uh, medications in the needed areas. And of course, having the mobile apps, you know, uh, that can remind patients uh, um, on when uh, they should take their medications are key areas in which the pharmacy role in the African region is evolving into. Next slide. So in conclusion, really pharmacist role is actually quite evolving in the African region. And um, uh, in order to be successful though, we need specializations and competencies in public health. Uh, we need pharmacists I mean, to specialize in infectious diseases, including it, um, uh, neglected triple diseases, but also we have to be able to actually understand and, and specialize in pharmacoepidemiology and be able to work in public health institutions. We have to revamp the pharmacy education curriculums in colleges and um, in universities uh, that focus in areas of tropical diseases that we actually face on a daily basis and other infectious diseases. 
we should be able to actually face these global challenges by expanding that role and having more pharmacists get into biotechnology, into research and development arenas to ensure that there are new antimicrobials that are being developed and vaccines, but also ensuring that we incorporate IPC interventions, including uh, uh, the role of the pharmacist uh, in being able to provide a lot of these vaccines as is being done in the northern countries. It is critical that pharmacists uh, get more involved in, into research, both clinical research, behavioral and innovation, but also advocating through our societies and as, you know, uh, um, and as members of FIP, in expanding our roles in the countries that we have, in areas that I've mentioned, vaccinations and screening, medication safety and surveillance. The involving nature of infectious and tropical uh, diseases and the, the, um, the, uh, the re-imaging infectious uh, diseases necessitates that uh, we actually take up digital health, really solutions, that would help in our provision of care, but also in containing the uh, most of the, the infectious diseases that we have. Next slide. With that, I believe that uh, we have a greater role as really pharmacists uh, in this expanding uh, landscape. And as our role evolves, we should also evolve in terms of what we can do concerning infectious and tropical diseases. Thank you. My sincere apologies for my bad internet connection. I sincerely apologize. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murphy, for a very brilliant uh, presentation. There's so much, uh, but there's not enough time. If I might, when you look at the amount of uh, information which we need, so that we can improve the palette of pharmaceutical care, which we provide as pharmacists in our different areas of practice, starting from the uh, beginning research and development, distribution, patient education, monitoring after use. So there's a lot which we can do as pharmacists to make sure that the products which are on the market, which are named medicines, actually give the best outcomes for patients. So in this respect, uh, we have got a polls which uh, are going to be administered. We'll give you five minutes. There's uh, the French version and the English version. So there are the polls for us to go through. This will help us to develop the, the programs and make them even more significant for us. As we do the polls, I can pick a statement which has been, uh, which has been mentioned by Dr. Mpundu. And he was talking about prescribing under the counter by pharmacists is one of the problems we have. I don't know whether you have it in your own countries, but how can we improve in our behavior and, and minimize antimicrobial resistance? because of misuse or misprescribing. At the end of the day, it's about the medicines. And in fact, in the pipeline, we don't have many antimicrobials which are being produced or any new products. We can have the next slide, please, on the polls. So the, on question one, 84%, they agree that misuse has a significant impact on the health of the public. Thank you. We can go on to the next question. Uh, 
these pharmacies, infectious disease and tropical diseases, are they common in our areas of practice? We can respond. So based on our settings, uh, how is the situation with respect to cases of infectious and tropical diseases in our practices? Thank you. So from the poll results, 37% uh, they strongly agree and 53% uh, agree 10%, well, it's neither here nor there. They neither agree nor disagree. And then 4%, they disagree. So depending on the settings, you may not be coming across some of these medical conditions. Thank you. The next poll, how often do patients directly ask for anti-infectives without, I want to underline, without a prescription. Thank you. So you find uh, that uh, it's a phenomenon where people do come in and ask for a, an antimicrobial or an anti-infective without a prescription. 57% of uh, our members here present or the, they found, they've received this request quite often. And very often is 33%, always is 7%, never is 4%. I, I suppose it also depends on the area of practice. You may never uh, come across that, or you, you always have people coming in when they've got any infection, be it a viral, microbial, they are always asking in some instances. So at the end of the day, how do we deal with this? This is now where our practice standards come into play and how we can curb antimicrobial resistance. Thank you for the poll. Thank you very much uh, to the members who are here present and the, uh, the, and, and the polls. The poll results help us to know where we are coming from and where we are going. Our next presenter is a, Professor Arenola Joda, she's from the Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Lagos in Nigeria. She's a very active member of the African Pharmaceutical Forum. She's currently the Deputy General Secretary and the Editor-in-Chief for the African Pharmacist, which is the magazine for the African Pharmaceutical Forum. Dr. Arenola, welcome. Thank you so much. You can take uh, over. Good afternoon. And good evening, everybody. Uh, next slide, please. Well, welcome to this webinar. And I'm sure you have learned a lot already from uh, Dr. Mpindu's uh, lecture. Next slide, please. 
Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Okay. So in my outline, I'm going to be presenting on the introduction, um, the common infectious diseases uh, that are seen in Nigeria. I'll take a brief look at our Nigeria health policy with respect to infectious diseases and then the role of pharmacists in Nigeria about infectious and tropical diseases, and then we'll conclude. Next slide, please. So I'll just say that we, as, as pharmacists, whichever area of pharmacy practice we find ourselves, we have a role to play in preventing, managing, and treating infectious diseases. And we must play these are our roles. We must play it very well, despite all the odds. I say despite all the odds because I know that there are very many uh, forces trying to stifle pharmacy practice, not only in Nigeria and not only in Africa, in some other uh, even well more developed countries. But despite these challenges and um, demotivators, we know that we're uniquely positioned to provide care to our clients because of our training. Uh, there's no there's no pharmacy training anywhere that is Excuse not um Dr. Jordan. Packed. Hello. Can you can you increase your volume? Oh wow, sorry. Okay, so I said we have a role to play because of our unique position. Is it better now? Sounds better. Yeah, because some people could not hear properly. Thank okay, you. Okay, so Hello, is it better now? Okay, so we're uniquely positioned because of our training, because of our proximity to patients and the community. As community pharmacists, especially, we're right there in the communities. We know our clients, we know what their issues are, and we know how to help them. We're very accessible, and research has shown and keeps showing that pharmacies are one of the most accessible healthcare providers and one of the most trusted <coughs> professionals across the board. <coughs> because of our medicine's expertise, we have a role to play in treating, managing, and preventing infections. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the common infectious diseases, and I put, of course, malaria as number one, and it's, it's, a, it's an issue that is uh, affli afflicting and affecting us in Nigeria. And quite a number of pharmacists have innovative ways of managing um, malaria, typhoid fever, upper respiratory tract infections and influenza, uh, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS, urinary tract infections and sexually transmitted infections. <laughs> And of course, we have the virals, Ebola, Lassa fever, and other uh, vector borne diseases, etc. These are common infectious diseases that we come across uh, on a daily basis, whichever area of practice uh, we find ourselves in as pharmacists. Next slide, please. So, our Nigeria health policy has something to say about uh, communicable or infectious diseases as we have it. The section 2.4 talks about major causes of disease burden in Nigeria. And it says that 66% of the total burden of sickness and morbidity or morbidity in Nigeria is due to communicable diseases. Specifically mentioning malaria, acute respiratory tract infections, measles, uh, TB, HIV, AIDS, and neglected tropical diseases, as uh, Dr. Mfundo has mentioned, filariasis, onchocerciasis, trachoma. These are the cause of over 60% of the disease burden in Nigeria. And of course, we can't miss out uh, diarrhea as one of the major causes of childhood mortality. Then the next uh, ca cause of disease are the non-communicable disease. I look I remember a time when we used to say in Nigeria that no, non-communicable diseases are not our problem. It's only infectious diseases. But now we have the big four like everybody else. <laughs> the big four being cardiovascular diseases, um, diabetes mellitus, cancers, and 
COPD, chronic ob obstructive pulmonary disease. We also have them uh, now in, in, in large numbers. Other NCDs include injuries, disability, mental health disorders, and malnutrition, to mention a few. And then the third big category of uh, disease burden in Nigeria are pregnancy and birth-related complications. And many of these are further complicated by uh, infections. Next slide, please. Section 4.1.2 of Nigeria Health Policy talks about prevention and control of communicable disease with the goal to significantly reduce the burden of communicable diseases in Nigeria in line with the targets of the third sustainable development goal. I brought this here to show that there's really nothing that we as pharmacists cannot contribute to this, uh, to this aspect of, of the health policy to foster behavioral change, improve access to quality care and support uh, services for persons living with HIV AIDS, promote integrated approach, reduce malaria burden, achieve eradication of polio uh, through communication, through awareness referrals, eliminate tropical, <laughs> uh, neglected tropical disease and, uh, and so on. Next slide, please. So then I'll now be talking about the pharmacist roles in particular, and I try to look at the, look at these roles from the lens of the various practice areas. Um, so one, looking at prevention practices that pharmacists are currently doing. A lot of pharmacists are involved in um, advising their clients about vector control for malaria and other vector-borne diseases. Uh, correct and consistent condom use to prevent sexually transmitted infections, hygienic practices, especially with regards to urinary tract infections, and then of course appropriate vaccinations. Whether as an immunizer, we recently got um, approval to serve as immunizers for COVID vaccines in Nigeria. But there are also facilities that are pharmacies that are using their facilities as immunization uh, centers. You know, so. These are all prevention practices that pharmacists are engaged in. Screening is another important role community pharmacies are engaged in. For instance, screening for hepatitis, for HPV, HIV, for TB. We, uh, community pharmacists are doing a, a great work in trying to identify those that need uh, quick treatment or those that need uh, appropriate <clears throat> referrals. Counseling, of course, the big role that pharmacists play, whether it's for drugs counseling or for ad um, adherence counseling, to ensure that, for instance, patients, uh, people living with HIV and AIDS, they use their drugs appropriately, they adhere to their medications, those on TB, because they can get tired because it's, it's, it's a treatment that lasts for, for, for quite a while, and so patients can get tired, and pharmacists are involved in encouraging and ensuring adherence for them to complete the course of therapy for even the short ones like three-day malaria you find people not finishing their, their therapy and then coming back with another infection in a short while then for them to use appropriately with meals or not with sufficient water with timing if it's uh, something that has to, to to be six hourly that they ensure that they they they, they know about this scheduled and they um, adhere to it next slide please for community and, and next slide. For community and hospital pharmacists, uh, they're also involved in chemo prof uh, prophylaxis, uh, advising clients that may be traveling or that have traveled in and need to be protected from malaria and some other uh, conditions that they can be protected against. Uh, chemo prophylaxis for pregnant women with uh, with re regards to people's immune status and and then. And of course, for patients that are suffering from sickle cell uh, disease, so that they are they are protected against coming down with infections. Dispensing and recommendations, I put that as a role that we play in both hospital and community pharmacies. We dispense according to prescriptions. We'd recommend uh, based on patients' symptoms or objective signs that we may uh, identify in the pharmacy, we, we do an assessment and then we have a plan. Some pharmacies use treatment algorithms to manage their clients. A patient comes with a prescription, he doesn't come with a prescription, they have a step-by-step -step, uh, questioning 
that they will engage those clients on to know what they need to do, whether to send them for a lab for investigation, whether they to refer them at the end of the day, whether there are danger signs that they are uh, identifying. For instance, a patient that comes that presents with um, a, 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 a sign that may be lead, linking to uh, a, a sexually transmitted infection and you will realize that this person maybe recently had an abortion, could be having pelvic inflammatory disease, and this may need to be managed at a health facility, and then you refer. So using whether the whether you're using the syndromic approach, whether you're using an algorithm, whether the, you're using the soap or farm notes, uh, pharmacists are involved in dispensing and recommendations for infectious disease. Malaria, tests before treatment is the new, uh, that's the, that's the uh, na National Malaria Strategic Plan uh, requirement for malaria now. Before 2014, 2020 strategic plan, it was presumptive treatment. So whenever signs indicates that a patient has malaria, then they will start the malaria treatment. But pharmacists are ensuring that patients get tested now because the, uh, the incidence of malaria, though still high, has reduced significantly. And so there's a need to ensure uh, there are, there's differential diagnosis that is that is that before you treat start treating for malaria, and then ensuring that we use the clients use antimicrobials judiciously. We have the antimicrobial resistance uh, aware classification of WHO, and pharmacists are involved in um, trying to ensure that there is no further abuse of um, of antimicrobials, some pharmacists are, are responsible for that. One of the one of the poll questions asked if uh, patients come asking for 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 antibiotics without prescription, and that's that's one of the very constant things that we have in Nigeria. But even with rec recommendations that are given, then they have to be sure that these patients really need these um, these uh, antimicrobials. Extemporaneous preparations and compounding, ensuring that appropriate dosage forms are given to children, for instance, the elderly, depending on renal status or other disease status. And then, of course, according to good manufacturing practices, for those that are involved in compounding, they ensure that they produce the products that these clients need in a state that it would not uh, add any uh, issue on safety or sterility to the client. Next slide, please. We're still going on with some of the additional, some of the roles that pharmacists play, whether in the hospital or in community in Nigeria. And referral, I've already uh, alluded to that. When there are danger signs that are identified, when you have treated and there's no improvement, and you have ensured that that patient was actually adhering to the treatment, or when patients uh, present with something that is out of scope of your, of your competency, then you refer the patient. Telepharmacy and use of digital tools is being engaged in in some hospitals and some community pharmacies with development of electronic uh, health records, although still at very rudimentary stages. But we have some community pharmacies that are using social media and other digital tools to reach their clients, to deliver drugs to their patients, to um, identify those that need um, specialized counseling, maybe because of their uh, disease status or their, com or their comorbidities or their uh, poor adherence states. They're using these digital tools to identify th those that require these services. Also those that have not filled their prescriptions in a while, uh, although this one may, may go more for non-communicable diseases, but even for patients that have taken anti-infectives to find out how the infectives uh, worked if they are, if they are symptom free uh, or if they need additional management. Emergency preparedness, I added this because we are still pan, uh, battling with COVID and the next pandemic, nobody knows when it will come. And so hospital, community, pharmacists, everybody is trying to get themselves ready to be sure that we're prepared before the next one comes. Next slide, please. In addition, uh, industrial community hospital pharmacies are responsible for ensuring medicines availability. The COVID pandemic 
impacted greatly on uh, on supply chain and pharmacists had to ensure that they they uh, they, uh, they they get genuine affordable accessible medicines to their patients and even for those that are using herbal medicines pharmacists also were responsible for uh, seeing to the availability of course marketing and distribution are some of the roles that pharmacists also do to ensure that medicines are available next slide please so academic pharmacists also wind come up? In, all right then also also coming when it comes to documentation dr Mpindu mentioned research and then of course pharmacovigilance documenting when there are adrs when there are unusual effects because we know that when we don't document then it is assumed that it was not done next slide please so some of the motivators i i i, I want to put them in a positive light so it is not that um Pharmacists, as I said, we have a role to play, but we need some motivators. We need some specific policy backing in Nigeria. Pharmacies as primary care centers, especially for community pharmacies. Pharmacies, uh, pharmacies as immunizers after training and certification, of course, but that should be open for all vaccines, not just the COVID vaccines. And then, of course, role recognition as public health uh, professionals. Remuneration will also motivate uh, pharmacists to do more for the value added services that they're already providing as well as additional patient care activities that they could add on. And then of course, access to learning certification platforms that will help pharmacists to stay abreast of current uh, opportunities and information. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I say we are pharmacists, we know our roles, we are playing our roles, but we need support both from government, from our societies, and from international organizations. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Joda, Radinola. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I know there's so much to talk about, about our roles as pharmacists, and uh, we had to cut you short because time is not on our side. Uh, before we listen to the next presenter, uh, which is uh, Dr. Natalie Shellac. She's a pharmacist who was a nurse initially and uh, is now is a pharma, then trained as a pharmacist and is doing a PhD. Uh, welcome, Dr. Shellac. It's nice when you have got, a, I, I usually call you a, a multidisciplinary team in one, being a nurse and being a pharmacist. Welcome. I, I hand over to you now. You can take over. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much, um, uh, Jocelyn and colleagues, and Fit for arranging this event. So I'm gonna get my laptop's computer. It seems as though I've got this little spot here. Okay, so thank you, yes, very much. Um, you can advance to the next slide. So I'm just going to discuss some of the activities that's been done in South Africa, um, and you can move to the next slide and what our case studies are. So today I would like to ask the audience, can you foretell the future? So in terms of antimicrobial stewardship, there's a lot of uh, languaging around, we are losing the fight, but really what's happening in the different African countries and uh, some of the things that's happened, we really didn't expect. So are we losing the fight? Um, Fleming already said in 1937 that we are losing the fight, but are we really losing it? So this is just a, a small changes or things or, that we've done in South Africa. Next slide, please. So this is a paper that we've done in Sub-Saharan Africa that we published maybe a month ago where we looked at, you know, what is the challenges tackling antimicrobial resistance across Sub-Saharan Africa, the challenges and the implications for the future. And what you can see when we asked our colleagues across Sub-Saharan Africa is that everyone knows that antimicrobial resistance and from the epidemiological data that we are seeing is growing. The WHO also have concerns around the national action plans for many of the countries around Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so, for example, Namibia and Botswana still needs to launch their plans. And the key challenges that were identified by our colleagues, and this was a collaborative effort, were there's a lack of expertise and local focal points towards surveillance of resistance. There's not enough human resources. You know, we don't have all of the systems in place that everyone else has, and that's what we really should focus on. Next slide, please. 
So one of the biggest mechanisms that we've seen, we knew we are going to get antimicrobial resistance, but what we didn't know is this whole black swan event. And a black swan is something that's happening that you knew, you know it is there. So for example, we know that resistance is there, but what we didn't expect is these promiscuous, the promiscuity of these organisms. For example, between the gram-negative bacilli, there were exchanges um, between Esterichia coli and we have ST131. This is hot off the press in South Africa. You can see an increase in antimicrobial resistance by 18.9%, which doesn't sound like a lot, or 18.6%. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it really is very worrying because our polymyxins is our, you know, one of the last two drugs of resort. Next slide, please. So we have to know that there's a lot of attention being paid to stewardship in South Africa. Next slide, please. So South Africa um, is... 86% of the population relies on the public health sector. And I think that's really where our focus are. And, and we are focusing, we're trying to move away from all of the focus that we have in the private sector. And we're trying to look at, you know, what is happening in the public sector. Next slide, please. And I wanted to share this with you. And you can see there are all the links that I've included, um, which is updated now in August. So this is South Africa has got a national strategic framework that is to end in 2024 where we've got goals that were placed there by the ministerial advisory committee that's more or less in line with the who but it's not only just in line with the who but it's also aligned to what is happening in africa and what is unique to south africa next slide please so this is from that framework and you can see really what what we've identified that education and communication and public awareness is, is a big focus point or is the just the basis that we are building on. We wanted to enhance surveillance. We wanted to look at antimicrobial stewardship. And we want to look at IPC. IPC is often the orphan child of stewardship. But in for South Africa, with our high burden of communicable diseases, it's really, really important. And then there has to be governance. In other words, we have to monitor and follow this up. And then we have to look at the impact of this rational antimicrobial use. Next slide, please. So what we've done is we've never had utilization data in South Africa for the public sector, which I've just mentioned earlier is 86%. And we wanted to, we've got a paper, but largely still a, a paper-based system. So we looked at tender data, um, you know, in other words, for, in our country, you have to tender to get an award, for example, to supply penicillin. And because we didn't have any other way, you know, an electronic way, we looked at tender data. Next slide, please. And we converted that to marketing terms. Next slide, you can yes, the marketing terms. And again, you can tap again. We looked at the compound annual growth rate. We looked at the class unit um, market share. And you can see in the price, the raw spectrum penicillin is still made up 5%. But, and, but in all in all, in the private sector, um, antimicrobial use reduced by 2%. Next slide, please. And if we want to look at... Um, the, you know, compare it between the public and the private sector, you'll see in the public sector, antimicrobial use has gone up by 11% for that same period. And again, the broad spectrum penicillin says by 20%. But what we found there is that all other antibacterials has increased by 6,876%. And the main culprit there is really um, linozolid. And then we knew, we, we know that we've got challenges in um, you know, XDR and MDR um, TB. So I just wanted to share this with you so that you can see how utilization data can really drive resistance. But we know that um, a large portion of antimicrobials are used. We've got a very big agricultural sector. So we have to look at our, as part of this one house, we have to look at our agriculture partners. And what the agricultural um, sector has done, um, they, they actually stopped, next slide please, the use of colistin in all as a growth promoting agent because we found that there were genetic elements that were being transferred by animals to humans. So you may never have used colistin, but your animal may have used colistin. And that's really, really important, you know, that we, we can work in the specific human sector as much as we want. But if we don't focus on our agricultural partners, then we are really facing an uphill battle. Next slide, please. So um, in this paper, we just highlighted that um, in terms of the cholesterol and they stopped the use of cholesterol in, in, in humans. And we made that a really big thing in South Africa so that we don't have that. Um, yes, next slide, uh, please. 
So we decided to move to an electronic platform because of our bases, you know, we're very restricted. And we look at the WHO and everyone can access this, uh, your e-profile for your country. Before we started, we saw that, you know, almost 1.6%, uh, uh, every one person has 1.6 phones. So we know that we have mobile phones and we can use this as part of our strategy and surveillance. Next slide, please. So we knew it was possible and we used eHealth. So eHealth is like an elephant and it's got specific elements and it's very well um, used in South Africa. Next slide, please. So we decided to focus on mHealth and based on mHealth, as part of all of these things, we, we, we have to look at what's feasible for our country and it shouldn't just be uh, something that you hit and run. It's something that should be sustainable. So feasibility and sustainability in using eHealth is really, really important. So what we've done is, next slide please, is with the mHealth is we have developed a, a app and we use this app and we first piloted it in one in one hospital and we saw wow it's working it's reducing our time for surveillance from um, 11 minutes to two minutes per patient bed and we could deliver ddds to the who standard next slide please and um we developed this app everyone can it's, it's freely available and um, this is the login screen next slide please and we tested it across South Africa. And for the next um, part of our study, we also looked at community health sectors and we also looked at district hospitals because that's data that we don't have. Next slide, please. And when we converted it to DDDs, we also found in line with our tender data that the beta-lactams is still the biggest driver of antimicrobial use, which is part of the access if you look at the where classification. But what we found here, what, which was very surprising, is we found the increased use of fluconazole, which actually told us, you know, that we are facing a big crisis in uh, anadiol resistance. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see there uh, the, the majority were used in uh, according to the different categories. You can also look at it according to the medicine, surgical and ICU data. And we found that the way were more or less in line. Reserve antibiotics were used mostly in ICUs, which is good. But we found some reserve antibiotics being used in the community sectors, which are very, very worrying. Next slide. Okay, so um, this is in the community healthcare sectors, and then we th we saw that it was in line, um, next slide please, with what we found, that it was mostly access data and most in line. We also use quality indicators, and the quality indicators tells you if this is correct, the utilization data is correct. So you can't do just a PPS without a quality indicator. Next slide please. Okay, so this is all the aspects of antimicrobial stewardship that we've discussed now, but I just want to share with you one or two things. I've got, I'm cognizant of my time. Next slide, please. Okay, An interdisciplinary approach. Next slide. And our Minister of Health is on board. Next slide, please. As I've said, it was signed by all of the necessary parties. Next slide. And we are all working together in South Africa. You can't do stewardship alone. Next slide. This is a, a group for Africa that you can join, Muria, if you want. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. So um, we found that there isn't great compliance to our strategy framework. So you can have a strategy framework, but without implementing, it's, it's not working. Next slide. I'm going to finish now. So we're working together with our nurses and our doctors and our pharmacists. Next slide. And next. So this is the last two slides that I want to end off with is we looked at, um, you know, what is the languaging around stewardship? Next slide. So we went into taxis because this is the biggest source of transport in South Africa, because if your community doesn't know, you know, what the wording is and what we found in our 11 different languages, there's just no words in our other, in our colleagues or in our fellow African languages, there's no words for antibiotics, antibiotic resistance, antibiotic use. So how can we educate our population if we don't have the words in our indigenous languages? And this is from this study. This is my last slide. Next slide, please. And this is a study that we've done in terms of we wanted to see if antimicrobials are available over the counter because there were rumor that it was. And then um, we found that actually, you know, in 80% of the time, we, the ant pharmacists gave out um, antibiotics for a urinary tract infection. And, you know, from this study, we did, we decided to, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be a punitive consequence. In other words, we know that antibiotics are being used over the counter in rural sectors. 
But we are trying to see if we can't have a prescribing license for pharmacists in very remote and rural settings where there isn't a clinician or a nurse to assist, because then instead of being punitive, we'd rather educate. And with that, I'd like to end off my um, presentation um, and thank the hosts and everyone. We are moving um, for for letting me allowing me to present, and I'm really looking forward to questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Natalie, for a very brilliant pre uh, presentation, uh, giving us an insight uh, into an insight into what is happening in South Africa and how best we can uh, learn from others. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do now, I'm going to invite our presenters so that we can hear all together after their initial presentation, so that they can respond to some of the questions which have been raised during the presentation, so that we can clarify some of the matters which uh, arose uh, during your presentations. So I would ask the presenters to come on screen and then we can uh, talk about uh, the perspectives and the questions. Because from your perspectives and in the African context, what are the challenges pharmacists encounter in carrying out their roles in infection and tropical disease prevention and management? And what solutions can be uh, provided to the suggested challenges? This is what we're we trying to be what we're trying to share from the different areas. But as you did your presentations, there were questions which were proffered from the members. Uh, let me go through the questions and then uh, whoever got a question, then they can respond. We'll ask you to respond to the question associated with your presentation. But all the same, thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Joda, uh, Shelak, and uh, Mpundu. Right, the question here, which I have here, first question. Thank you all for the presentations, Dr. Joda. Uh, are extemporaneous preparations and compounding still common in your area? If yes, what kind of preparations are often prepared? Does it mean that physicians still ask for specific preparations? And what kind of background training or specialization is needed for a pharmacist to prepare these? Thank you. This is from Madagascar. Thank you very much. You can much, answer it uh, live. Okay. I actually was going to answer, type my, uh, the answer, but I then clicked on live. I was not looking. You know, but um, yes, we do still do some uh, compounding here in Nigeria. Uh, the hospital pharmacist group especially are in, involved with compounding preparations, especially most of the time for children when specific dosage forms are not available and children need uh, those, uh, those drugs, then they are compounded in the hospital pharmacy. Also, we have those, as I mentioned, maybe because of their immune, uh, their renal status or their liver function, then they need some uh, compounding, uh, some special preparation to be made for them. With regards to, there's no additional qualification you need to be involved in compounding other than your or your original BFAM degree, because uh, the basic skills that are needed are already available as part of our training in, in pharmacy. But um, there are, I, I know that there is, um, there are additional certification courses that some people can have engaged in to further uh, fine tune their skills, especially uh, because it's not, it's not as common as it used to be, but we still, have quite a number of uh, quite quite some number of products that need co uh, compounding, and then um, I think the the in addition the association of hospital pharmacists hospital administration they recently did an update training for their members on compounding because they also identified that there are some products that they could actually help compound which they had not been. Um, awake to that responsibility. So uh, it's something that is, is, is still being done here in Nigeria. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Dr. Joda, for your response. And uh, may, just uh, to support on that, in some instances when kids are given, uh, say, tablets or adult dosages, the dosage forms rather, 
it means we're assuming that uh, children are small adults, of which they are not. So formulation for pediatric formulation uh, for pediatric products is a role which pharmacists should take up. And uh, as such, there's the need in that area. The next question is, uh, I would like to add that pharmacists significantly positively impact problems like infectious diseases and quality healthcare provision, especially when holistic pharmacy practice is embraced above just clinical pharmacy practice. Oh yeah, there was a question, but it was in, not in this platform. It was in the chat, uh, in the chat box. Uh, the question was, uh, it appears the focus has been on clinical pharmacy and we seem to be forgetting about the other areas of practice. Is that so? In terms of the roles which we have been talking about, uh, I would want to throw it at uh, the panelists. Maybe uh, Natalie can respond to that. How do you see that? Um, Are we focusing just more on a clinical pharmacy? Thank you. Um, I think it's a valid comment because, you know, we hear the word clinical pharmacist, especially from the US and from Europe. And in South Africa, we also have clinical pharmacists, but it's not yet registered at the South African Pharmacy Council. But in all of our studies and in all of our research and in our AMS committees, pharmacists, regardless of whether they are clinical pharmacists or if they are just pharmacists, you know, pharmacist assistants, nursing staff, everyone plays a role. So we don't have just clinical pharmacists that participate in these activities. You know, in the face of this big challenge that we have, I mean, we actually globally only have a few compounds or a few antibiotics left for gram-negative infections. So it's, it's all hands on board, you know, even though it sounds as if it's just clinical pharmacists, but everyone needs to get together and, you know, apply themselves. Thank you. Thanks, Jocelyn. Thank you. Jocelyn, can I add something to that? Yes, please. Okay, I, I want to take the question from the point of um, clinical pharmacists vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, we're losing focus on production pharmacy, we're losing focus around research and development, uh, developing pharmacists for that aspect of pharmacy life, uh, not just for clinical pharmacy. I put, on the, I put in my response to this question that when the uh, Pharmacy Council of Nigeria was um, proposing the FAMD for, Ni for Nigeria, we kept saying something around a homegrown FAMD program, such that we didn't want pharmacists of the future to just be trained as clinical pharmacists with, just the, with only uh, a bias for the hospital and community. We wanted to have pharmacists that will still be very relevant in the industries and in the research institutes, as well as in various other uh, practice areas. And so our FAMD has a lot of the science component of the BFAM, as well as the clinical component for the FAMD, so that we have our pharmacists that are still, those that still want to veer into uh, research and development, they want to go into uh, production, they are still well equipped for that. But it is an issue uh, when, and I, and, I, and I mentioned that it is something that has to be taken up at the global level such that we don't leave um, the science bit out of pharmacy. You know, uh, FIP uh, talks at, on the, is based on the, on the three stands, the, the tripod of um, science, practice, and education. And we have to take that into our various countries such that we have pharmacists ready to serve in these various areas as well, not just in the clinical functions. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Dr. Joda. I think it makes a lot of sense because if I look at the presentations from uh, the speakers here, they've talked about the roles of pharmacists and it's not just one role. Uh, even when you start from the supply chain, starting from research and development, so our training, the education and everything, and including regulatory, where yeah. you are looking at the legislation, yeah. which will affect what, uh, how pharmacists practice so that uh, everything uh, falls into place. It's uh, not. It's only maybe inside the focus 
has been to trying to strengthen the roles of pharmacists as in the clinical aspects of pharmacists. But as uh, alluded to by Dr. Joda, it might be, it's important maybe then at some point to classify some areas as specialization so that you have got a basic pharmacist a program which strengthened by the other specializations so that all the other areas on the roles are done properly based on a sound scientific knowledge. Thank you very much. Let me check on in the box again. There's a number of questions. Uh, there's a question there. Do you have any suggestions how we can arrange for pharmacy students training in different countries in Africa? I'm a microbiology professor in private university in Egypt. Do we have a program where we're trying to encourage uh, multi-country training, so that, or that, not quite standardization, but adopt and adapt according to the country's needs so that people can learn from others? Is there a, something in the pipeline or which is going on at the moment I'm thinking of things like a uni twin or association of Africa, uh, schools of pharmacy. I don't know. It's a, I can throw it at you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I responded to that question by saying that um, through the FIP, we're working on establishing an, an Africa-wide association of schools of pharmacy. And these ones established will be a veritable tool for uh, sharing uh, experiences, sharing platforms, sharing teachings, exchanges, curriculum reviews with an African uh, uh, content, you know. So that is something that is being worked on uh, currently. But in the, in the meantime, also because the UNITWIN program, you, the Center for Excellence in Africa program has taken place and has shown that we can do more by collaborating, we can begin to reach out. We, you know, we have these various platforms where we meet ourselves at FIP, at various other events. We meet, we collect our numbers, and then we thereafter forget the, the cards in, in, a, in a wallet somewhere. But you have these contacts that you have made through various FIP event, uh, uh, congresses that you have been attending. You can reach out to people across institutions in Africa and find out what they have that you can benefit from that your your faculty your school your students or your 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 staff can benefit from and then we can take on the discussions from there there's nothing stopping us we have these links already that we are not uh, properly utilizing that's that's my contribution on that oh thank you i just because i wanted you to highlight on that aspect to everyone so that people are aware that their efforts to try and make sure that there's inter country, interregional, and international links to try and uh, uh, come up with one FIP where you are looking at pharmacists uh, all over the world with the basic pharmacy training and then adopt and adapt according to the needs from the various countries. Uh, let me check. Yes, you can uh, comment in as well. Thank you. Um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, Nihan has also posted now that FIP will be publishing a report in 2023 that everyone can look at with some support for educators and trainers. But maybe just from my side, we're all working, you know, across Africa. You know, all of the work that you are seeing is, is from myriads, from work that we're doing together. But what we are seeing now of, you know, this is our work, we've been working across Africa now for maybe seven or eight years. So even though we work together, you still need to have the individuality of that country. You know, so we, we started to investigate, for example, over the counter use of antibiotics because it was based on comments made from our colleagues in Kenya. So we we all we identified common themes and then we went back to our country and everyone goes to their country and they have a look at what's the situation there. And based on that, we apply ourselves. So education, I think, can be standardized across African countries and you know, like FIP is already doing, so it seems as though resources are there. But when we are starting to collaborate, you know, we have to look at what our needs are and then look at what's happening in our country. And then we also have to start, um, you know, publishing African recommendations. 
you know, and I think our voice is too silent, to be very honest. I really do. You know, we're always adapting European guidelines, American guidelines, blah, blah, blah. But we should be starting to publish African guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much, which is why it is important when I'm talking about adopt and adapt, so that according to our needs, according to our situation, because when I'm talking about, uh, if I, I recall from the presentation from Dr. Murphy, uh, apologies, he could not continue on the call due to network issues, but anyway, he referred to the issues of poverty and uh, communicable diseases, the vicious cycle. When someone is, is in poverty, they cannot deal with the uh, communicable diseases. And when they've got uh, communicable diseases, it actually depletes the resources they have and it puts the family back into poverty. So it becomes a vicious cycle. So under our circumstances, as we talk about uh, our roles as pharmacists, we have to adapt and adopt according to our needs. So you find that our disease burden uh, is different from what you find in the higher income uh, economies. So it's important for us as we uh, come up with even with our solutions so that they can uh, penetrate to the people at the grassroots level. I'm seeing uh, there, there's a, a comment from uh, Neil Han. FIP has been partnering with WHO on their AMR curriculum for health professionals. And as she says, as I uh, alluded to earlier on, the report in 2023 will be based on the WHO curriculum colleagues. So everyone can actually benefit from that. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Can, I just, can I just say one thing about that? Yes, please. The final again, it's just one thing, great, Nian. You know, it, again, it's wonderful. It's a great initiative. But again, and I'm sorry if I'm saying this again, we, we also looked at the WHO Africa's guidelines, you know, for surgical prophylaxis. But we are doing a study now across Africa and we are seeing that, you know, half of the countries are not using cephas or not, don't have cephazolin as, as a drug to use for surgical prophylaxis. So it's great that we have that, but we first need to look at, you know, is it applicable that it, it, this came from the WHO Africa? So is it applicable to your country? So we have to adopt it based on our continent. And still, I'm going to say our voices are too silent. So if I be, that's great. Thank you very much. But is it applicable to our country and our continent? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time. We've got uh, just a few minutes left to wind off our presentation. So I want to move on to the next part, which is uh, the, the polls which help us to move forward. Thank you. So can you please administer the polls? Did you find this webinar useful for your area of practice? And there's also the French version. So we can give a minute for people to respond to that. Thank you. Um, Natalie, is that an old hand or something? Yes, sorry, Shop. it's a legacy hand. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I like that legacy hand. <laughs> thank you. I'm sure we've, uh, can we please have the, the answers to the poll? Thank you. The, we've got 51%, they strongly agree, and 44%, uh, they agree. So overall, it means about 95% of the people, they agree that uh, this is a useful webinar. And uh, it helps us to create more webinars when we ask uh, for questions on what more you want to learn uh, on this. And then 4% they disagree. Can they neither agree nor disagree. So then, then there's a comment there from my uh, FIP. Then there's the second question there. 
would you like to have digital events in 2023? We'll give you another a minute. You should just say yes or no. Because if you found it useful, then as FIP, we will be uh, in a position to try and come up with the topics or areas which are of interest to strengthen our roles as pharmacists in various areas of practice. Today, we are talking about antimicrobial resistance, but there are also other areas which we find are important for us as a pharmacist in Africa and as a pharmacist wherever we are. We can use the poll. Thank you. 98% uh, would like us to continue with uh, these uh, digital events. And 2%, they said no. Uh, but 98% of our members here present, they would like us to see uh, more of these digital events, which will strengthen our roles and make us better pharmacists. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I would like to appreciate our speakers, uh, Natalie Shellac, uh, Arinola Joda, and uh, Dr. Mervyn Mpundu, and uh, our facilitators from FIP, Neil Han and uh, Alison. I would like to appreciate your organizing from my, that office so that we come up with a program which is uh, suitable for us as pharmacists to make us better pharmacists and play our role. Antimicrobial resistance is a serious problem. And there's a, and as I alluded to earlier on by one of the presenters, you find that we don't know what is coming and what to expect. And uh, the bugs, they, they can play tricks around us. She, she, to quote what she said, they are being promiscuous. And then they become resistant to the products we try to use. And we also, it's important for us to work with other partners and the practitioners within the healthcare sector, including the agro industry. We find that uh, there's a residual antimicrobial agents in uh, food products. And as such, it's important for us to work together with the agro industry. Sometimes people call us pharmacists and uh, sometimes we call ourselves farmers, pharmacists or ph pharmacist. Uh, that's a, 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 to make to show that it is important for us to even work with farmers and just to make sure that we, do, we minimize some of these problems, uh, problems with antimicrobial resistance. It is my great pleasure that everyone uh, has participated and we look forward to, to, to 2023 with more programs to make you happy as pharmacists and to make you better pharmacists. If we have got any other questions, you can always get in touch through our website. Uh, we've got uh, other programs coming up. In uh, here, we're showing off one of the booklets which has been uh, shared through, which has been produced rather through FIP and it's available in English, French, and Portuguese. It's uh, on vector bone diseases. We can always find uh, information on our website. And there are more programs coming up which have been prepared through our FIP website. And uh, we've got a communicable diseases, the role of pharmacists in uh, prevention and management of vector borne diseases, the African region from the African perspective. Please check on our website, events.fip.org for future FIP digital events. We've got so much uh, prepared for you, so much on the plate for us to be pharmacists, one FIP. Pharmacists, wherever you are, we are one. Thank you very much. Have a blessed day. Thank you. We've come to the end of our session. Thank you. <laughs>